Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Becca Skinner, and I'm a National Geographic Young Explorer and an adventure photographer. And um, before I get started and tell you why in this photo I'm carrying 110 liters of camera gear across the coast of Canada, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background. So I'm based in Bozeman, Montana. It's so beautiful. And um, this is a little cabin that I, that I stay at quite often, but most of the time I'm on the road. And I know most of you have houses or apartments and maybe you're looking out the door at a front yard or a backyard, but my view often looks like this. This is my front yard or a backyard. I'm also based out of my bright yellow truck named Happy. Um, very unstealthy. Uh, it's about National Geographic yellow. But um, this is my view a lot of times when I'm on the road. And I was spending so much time on the road last year that I actually had a friend help build me a bed in the back of the truck. It's way more comfortable that way. So you can see the two storage systems on the side. And then I have this bed in the middle, which my dog and I fit perfectly in that little nook and um, obviously a coffee device in the corner. Um, and I would argue that this is actually more comfortable than my bed at home. So I know I just said I spend a lot of time outside or on the road, but I just wanted to give you some statistics about how much time I actually spend outside. So last year I kept track. And last year I slept outside for 242 nights which estimates to be roughly eight months of the year. Uh, that means I was inside about 123 nights, which also means I only took about 123 showers last year, <laughs> which is not that much. But don't be dissipated. I showered this morning. Please still come talk to me after the show. Um, but most of my showers looked like this. So. Being an adventure photographer means I get to see incredible places. My day is not ever the same. Um, it just keeps me on my toes. As you can see, there's quite a diversity of images in this picture. But um, yeah, it's always different. And that's part of the reason I love this job. The only thing consistent is I drink a very, very strong cup of coffee every morning. Um, but 90% of my job is really fun. And right now I'm working for a lot of outdoor companies creating content. Um, a few of these photos have not yet been published, so you get to see them first. Um, so yes, quite diversity. 90% of my job is really fun. And the other 10% is totally miserable. Well, kind of. Being an adventure photographer also means I'm dealing with the elements 24 hours a day, seven days a week when I'm out in the field. Not something you typically, typically think of when you see beautiful images on Instagram. Uh, so like this day, we were up at about 8,000 feet and the winds were about 30 miles per hour. And it got to the point where it was such a terrible blizzard outside that I could no longer see the people I was taking photos of. So I hunkered down for about 10 minutes till the whiteout passed, and then we decided it was probably okay. We, we could go home. Or there's days like this, where the elements turned me into a beautiful Lady Gandalf <laughs> with an ice beard. Um, on this morning, it is negative 20 degrees. I am wearing five jackets in this picture. And the condensation from my breath, um, because it was so cold outside, created this awesome ice beard in my hair. And I couldn't pull it apart until it melted, which wasn't until about 11 in the morning. And at these temperatures, you're also uh, being very aware of frostbite. And one of the people I was with started to get frostbite on her toes. So again, turned around and went back. Because also part of this job is knowing when to call it. Or there are days like this. It poured rain. Uh, last year, I was on an expedition with this guy, Bertie Gregory. 
and we were filming for uh, Birdie's digital series for Nat Geo Wild. It's called Wildlife, and it just finished its last episode, so you can still watch it, check it out. But in this photo, we're about 75 miles off the coast of Vancouver Island. We're the only people on the island, and we waved at our float plane as they dropped us off, hoping that we had enough food and gear and that our sat phone was working. And uh, Birdie is building a wildlife hide, which is basically a wildlife blind. Um, it breaks up your shape because we were on the coast and we wanted to try and find coastal wolves for this expedition. Uh, we needed a way to break up the shape so we would sit in this hide. And this actually contributed to about one month of my not showering because you can't alter your scent. Um, wolves will smell you, or wildlife has pretty great sense of smell. So um, no showering was a strict rule for this trip. And uh, I feel bad for our float plane pilot that had to take us home. Um, but in situations like this, where it's pouring rain, you're starting to be kind of concerned about your gear. Um, and that's a question that I get a lot, is how are you dealing with your gear when you're out in the field and the elements for the whole time. And the truth is, it gets first priority in your tent. <laughs> you must have a good tent. You need to really trust your equipment. Um, but there, this is about a quarter of our gear. Actually, I'm holding one camera. There's a few more behind me that you can't see. Um, this is a four-person tent. And in the spaces where two other people would typically lie, was all of our camera gear. When you want to stretch out, you can't because there's batteries behind you, batteries beside you. And we had to start sleeping with batteries in our sleeping bags. And it's not because there, I have a weird thing with batteries. Um, it actually helps prolong the life of them. So if they're not warming up and cooling, warming up and cooling, you can just stick them in your sleeping bag and your body heat helps keep them warm and they last longer. But I haven't always been an adventure photographer. I haven't always been on Instagram, which I will tell you about. But uh, I started Instagram in 2012. And at the time, um, it was just being used as a really casual way to share parts of your life. And no one was really using it for business or for promotion. And, um, so part of a, a really fun part of pulling together this presentation is I dug through my images and found my very first Instagram photo, which I am so excited to show you. It's really compelling. <laughs> my dog. <laughs> this is my dog, Vida Vu. Um, I, this is her sunbathing position. <laughs> And um, I saw her draped over this garden hose in the backyard. I thought it was funny because she pulls her legs up like a T-Rex when she's like that. And uh, obviously, pretty comedic. So um, on my iPhone, thought it was funny, snapped a photo, put like four filters on it because that's what you did, and uh, then posted it to Instagram. So not a lot of forethought. Also, my favorite section at the bookstore. Um, again, thought it was funny, took a photo with my iPhone, posted it immediately. Not a lot of forethought. So I had Instagram as an app, and I was also storytelling on the side. But it never really occurred to me that I could do both, that I could combine that effort, because no one was really using it like that. So in 2010, I had won a grant from the University of Wyoming to go document post-Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans and how they were recovering. Um, so this was kind of my first experience in the field, and that project led to a National Geographic Young Explorers grant to document post-tsunami Banda Aceh, Sumatra, that was pretty decimated by, by the tsunami. And um, if anyone in the crowd is between the ages of 18 to 25, or if you know someone in that age that you think might be interested in the Young Explorers grants, they're such an awesome opportunity. And please come talk to me afterwards, because um, it got my foot in the door with National Geographic. And it funded my first big 
field project was documenting the tsunami. And I, I had a kind of a similar idea for my Young Explorers grant on how Banda Aceh was recovering. And I, I feel like this photo really sums it up in my entire project into this image. Um, I like to play a game with this photo called Find the Boat. Yeah, sort of in the middle. Uh, this barge had floated inland, and you can see the coastline in this photo. So a couple miles it floated in, and it settled there. And instead of tear it apart, the Indonesians decided, we'll just build around it. So you can pay a penny, and you can walk up onto the barge and look out over the city of Banda Aceh, Sumatra. Um, but really, really interesting. So I came back from my Young Explorers project so jazzed about photography. Like, this is what I wanted to do. I was living my dream. But there was this big jump in my head between what I just got to do as a grantee and, and being a full-time photographer, and I didn't really know um, how to make that jump. So I was working for the state of Wyoming um, as a grant writer, and I decided to save up a bunch of money and that I would go travel. So I ended up taking time off of that job and traveling to just shoot photos because that's the only thing I knew how to do and the only thing I really wanted to do. So this road trip ended up being about 32,000 miles around the American West, um, just with my dog and I. This is on a small break. A, uh, a mouse had climbed into my engine compartment. And at the time, I was sleeping in this vehicle like, like I was sleeping in the truck. And um, the entire night, I could hear it run across the dashboard and it kept me up all night. So this is at like 5 AM in the morning. And uh, little did I know my traveling around the West and creating these images just because I wanted to and because I loved it. It was creating this kind of visual diary on Instagram. I made the switch. I stopped taking pictures with my iPhone and posting them. I was taking photos with my camera and posting them there. And um, I had no idea that people were paying attention until I started to gather this audience. And um, when I hit 20,000 followers, my mom wanted to get me a cake. And I was like, no, 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 no. We <laughs> No, 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 people don't do that. Thank you, though. Very, very kind. But um, I, I didn't really realize that people wanted to see what I was shooting until I started to gather this audience. So at the very end of 2014, I decided I would make the jump into full-time freelancehood. And it was like the major, major leap of faith for me. Um, and. So as soon as I like, publicly announced that I was going into full-time photography, I immediately panicked. I was like, oh no, maybe this isn't right. And so when I panic, I go fly fishing. So I left for a week on a fly fishing trip in the back country of Montana. And when I came out of the back country, I had an email from someone, uh, I thought it was spam, it wasn't spam. Um, it was from a fly fishing company that wanted me to shoot their entire campaign for that year. And when I finally spoke on the phone to them and asked them how on earth they had found me, they said, through Instagram. And that was my first freelance job, was they found me there. So for most of the half of 2015, the first half, this is last year. Um, I got that fly fishing job in 2014, and then I didn't get another email for months. Again, panic. So I decided, OK, I would go on more trips, because I knew that um, it, it was a gamble, but it was an investment in making more images, things that were compelling, and things that I wanted to see. And I think it shines through when you're doing something that you really love. And so I started creating things like this, just totally diverse. And then it struck me partway through 2015 that I could 
kind of start levering the audience that I had built on Instagram to companies or for projects that I wanted to do. I wanted to travel, and so I, I would send out notes to companies and say, are you interested in this expedition? And that's how um, the expedition to Panama was born. Uh, this is my friend Claire Fiesler, who's a fellow young explorer, grantee, and my favorite expedition partner. And uh, we had been in contact with this company called Oru Kayak, and we had proposed, it was Claire's idea, um, to circumnavigate this island outside of Panama called Bastimento. And uh, you can see it up there with the little pin. It, uh, it doesn't look that big, but um, it was a four-day trip. And we had two objectives for the trip. One, to do a social media story for Oru Kayak. And then two, to write a blog post for National Geographic Adventure. And uh, there were only some problems <laughs> to begin with. Um, problem number one, or complication number one. Claire and I had never worked together. And uh, this may not seem like a big deal, but sometimes your expedition partners, um, or sometimes your friends don't make the best expedition partners. So we had been talking about a much larger circumnavigation, and we decided we should probably make sure we like each other before we jump into a multi-month trip. So we started having these Skype phone calls, and we're at this time in two different countries, and both of us are traveling really frequently. So this Skype conversation was the last one before I went to Panama. And um, I am obviously have a headlamp on, and I'm like standing on my tippy toes at the top of a peak because that's where I can get cell phone service. And Claire is in her room in Panama, and um, she doesn't get cell phone service on the island either. So we're like trying to piece together these Skype meetings. Uh, problem number two, complication number two, we had never used the kayaks before. Let's keep that one in mind. Complication number three, we had no idea how much carrying capacity they had, which might not be that big of a deal uh, thinking about it, but when you start adding things up, uh, like our self-supported gear, um, tent, sleeping pad, uh, food, water, and then camera gear, and I don't know how many of you have a camera body with its various heavy, heavy appendages, but there, it starts to add up. So we had no idea how much would actually fit into the kayaks. Um, just a little bit of background on the kayaks. They start as a two by three box, and they unfurl into those large white kayaks that you saw Claire and I standing in front of, uh, roughly about 16 feet. Um, they are really, well, the website and directions said, give yourself 15 to 20 minutes to put them together. And so Claire and I were like, awesome, that's great. We can do that. So we put it off until the last thing we did. Um, it took us a little bit longer than 15 minutes. It took us about two and a half, three and a half <laughs> hours. Um, they are a little bit more complicated than we initially thought. So you can see it getting darker <laughs> and darker. The other thing that we kind of put off because we didn't know the carrying capacity uh, was the grocery list. And knowing that we were going to be kayaking multiple miles a day, um, I put together a last minute but very calorie efficient grocery list um, with what was available at the Panamanian grocery store on the island of Bocas del Toro. Cheese, peanut butter, apples, water, rum. <laughs> calorie efficient. So Instagram became this way to tell these little vignettes, these stories. 
um, or as I like to call them, learning curves of what was actually happening on the expedition. So uh, learning curve number one, Claire and I are in a rush to get out the door to start kayaking. We finally figure out that everything fits in the boats, win. The boats float, win number two. We finally start paddling, and it's been a year and a half since I've kayaked. I was carrying 110 liters through the temperate rainforest in Canada. I had not been rowing. So a few miles into the trip, I am hoping that my arms fall off to give me an excuse to stop paddling against the current. And I start to kind of panic because the current is really, really strong on the ocean side. And so it's pulling me one way and I'm just digging with my left hand and I'm starting to panic. And Claire's a, a little bit away from me and so I'm paddling and I yell, Claire, how much further do we have to go? And she's paddling, digging with her left paddle. She's like, I don't know, look at the GPS. And I'm paddling and I'm like, you have the GPS. And we both kind of turn and look at each other and stop paddling and realize that we left the GPS. Um, yes, this is a circumnavigation. There is an island on one side, there is an ocean on the other. It can't be that hard, right? Well, <laughs> there are these mangrove entrances with GPS coordinates. The mangroves are so thick from the outside in a lot of the places that we were going to stay, we actually could not locate where the mangrove entrances were. Um, this is when we finally found one. On the first night, we were going to stay at a fishing lodge, and they just happened to be blowing through conch shells. Um, and we were like, let's follow the conch shells. That sounds promising. And we ended up there. So good. Um, so this is the Instagram post that we did with this. Uh, the best and scariest parts about expeditions are the unknowns. There were quite a handful on this trip. Claire Fiesler attending to the fire after a long day of open ocean, dealing with my seasickness, and a lost GPS. Learning curve number two. Because we were lost, we were supposed to sleep at an indigenous village. And both of us were so excited about this because the southern part of the island is not a tourist destination. It does not get visited very often. And we had the opportunity to camp with the indigenous people in their village, which was so exciting. Uh, but because we were lost, we couldn't find the mangrove entrance, we decided to camp on this beach instead. Uh, the last photo that you saw, that's where we camped. And um, we decided the next morning, it's OK. We will find this village. We will portage, which when full of possessions, the kayaks, when we lifted them up to portage, started to bow the other way under the weight, which is not something you want from your foldable kayak. So scratch that plan, dump out all of our possessions, refold the boats, start portaging the boats with our camera gear on our backs. And we start to go down this trail, which it starts on this bridge, and then the trail is off to my right. And we start to go down this bridge, and we run into a local. So exciting. And the local gives us some very, very key information. Claire Fiesler in a short portage. Originally, Claire and I were going to portage our gear for a mile to an indigenous village. Right as we were packing up to start hiking, we were told that the dense jungle path we were going to use was actually a crocodile trail. <laughs> Narrowly avoided that one. So Claire and I had come up with a hashtag paddling Panama. You can kind of see it down there on the left. Um, and we used that to curate these images together to do this eventual blog post Mine is here on my left, and Claire's, How Circumnavigating an Island by Kayak is like speed dating. Uh, and we, we were laughing and joking while we were paddling that expeditions are like 
explorermatch.com because you're trying to put out these small little fires when you're panicking and you're like, oh, you deal with it like that? Me too, okay, we're good. We can go into the field together. We're a match. So Instagram has done so much for my life. Um, it's really broadened my world. It's allowed me to connect with people that I, that I never dreamed of connecting with and share my images just outside of my community. Um, I will continue to share. It's also introduced me to some of my best friends. This is my best friend, Heidi. And these are our seven-year-old chickens sitting on our heads. Um, it's introduced me to some wonderful people. And as much as it's broadened my world, it's really, it's really shrunk it, too. I, I use it to check conditions of places. If, if I'm going somewhere um, and need to look up the weather, then I will look up the location and um, see what has recently been posted. I obviously use it for business. Um, but yeah, it's also shrunk my world and introduced me to some really wonderful people. Um, it's such a great tool for connecting, so I hope you will connect with me there too.